We have all kinds of questions. Oh, okay. yay. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Really, really good questions, too. <laughs> you know, there was, there was this little flurry of conversation with the service additions, and I think your answer was awesome that this is the ultimate in adopt and adapt, right? You have to decide for your organization what's in scope, what's out of scope. One of the kind of specific questions that did come in on that line, along that line is, um, are there external compliance requirements, right? So you know, SOX, ISO, you know, any type of external legal regulatory requirements that you have to comply with, and then how do you ensure alignment with those requirements? I would think that if there is, in fact, a regulatory control, that would, in fact, be in scope, and you'd have to have a, a change for that, but I, I'd like you to answer that question. Yeah, so really great question. So uh, lots of different regulatory bodies within higher ed. Um, ultimately, we answer to the University System of Georgia, so the USG, that Board of Regents, um, often can tell us things we need to address quickly, but then that's really what a, an urgent change is for, is um, that audit, compliance, security, you have to address this and we don't have time to wait for your little rules on how long it takes to do something. So. So definitely, um, it's a different kind of regulatory environment than in the corporate world. I was a banker for about 10 years and talk about compliance. Wow. Uh, we don't, we have to deal with things like FERPA and things like um, student privacy and confidentiality. So those are the kinds of things that we'd have to address quickly. Did that answer that question? Yes. Okay. And so if something is, related to those things you do, it would be in scope. Oh, absolutely, as yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you, I, I feel like you kind of have answered this question, but there's a second part to the question. So um, do you evaluate the quality of changes? Was it successful versus not successful? And you kind of had in your reporting slide that you do look at, at, at failed changes. Um, and I would assume then you're tracking you know, successful changes as well. Um, the second part of that is, do you allow fix forward changes? So the, the first part of the question is, we actually designate as we close a change, if it was successful, successful with issues or non-successful. And we have some definitions around how that would work, but tell me again the second part of the question. Do you, do you allow for fix forward changes? What do you Which mean? Which I would interpret, forward? well, I would interpret to it to mean the change failed, but rather than back it out, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. In order to allow the change to be implemented. So the, the question is, the, the, I mean, the answer is it depends. <laughs> Don't you love those answers? <laughs> so. <laughs> If it is, um, if it is a, for us, the way we've defined it, if they get into a change and something doesn't work, but they have a, but they get a fix within the 24 hour period, within a, within that same day, they can make a, a, make a change. They can make a, a change to the change. They can add notes within the change request of what they did in addition and go ahead and fix it. Oftentimes they will call me when this happens or call somebody on our team. Because usually, you know, there's a there's a change person that's that's walking alongside them during the change anyway. I mean not physically, but, but they're involved in it. If it's something that they've got to contact a vendor or they've got to get a part or it's gonna it's gonna move outside of that 24 hour window, then it's a failed change and when they come back they'll do a new change request. But that's just how we've interpreted it. I don't, I, I don't know if there's an, I don't know what the official way to do that is, or what the proper way to do it is. That's just the way we do it. Gotcha. So hopefully that answered the question. And if not, shoot in a a, a follow up. Um, I'm going to um, ask two cab related questions. So just to to address all things cab all at once. 
So uh -huh. you mentioned that you your cab now meets once per month. And the question was, did you start with a cab in the very beginning when you first implemented your process? That's one yes. question. Yes, cab was the very beginning. That's what we started with. Okay. And did you meet like weekly in the very beginning and then and now you've yeah. gotten it down to once a month? Yeah, we met weekly for two hours in the beginning and they were packed sessions. So, but now nice. understand in the beginning, we've never done change before. So we talked through all of them. We, 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 we all committed to, we want to make this process work and work well. And, and now, and I mean, basically it's the same people as two years ago. Oh, that's an interesting thing about higher ed. There's not a lot of turnover, but um, <laughs> of course we, we know each other now and we know how, how we work and, and what works for us. Now I will tell you in a previous position in the corporate world, we ran cab a lot differently. So there's a lot of ways you can do cab and our cab in a previous role had 40 people on it, but they were split into teams. So based on the type of change it was, different people would meet for different reasons. That's not how it works at Georgia Tech. We have one cab, about 12 people, and it covers all the, the points that we think are important. And, and, it, gotcha. okay. and we do all the changes, yeah. And then does the um, authority slash cab consider the change itself and the implementation schedule at once, or is the change approved and then at a later time, the implementation schedule is established? Oh man, these are great questions. Yeah. Um, that's a really important thing to think about. So I'm so glad somebody asked that question. So for us, we consider the calendar at the same time we consider approval. And, but now it's always, especially for medium and high risk changes, it's, it's a work in process. So I think that that's something you need to consider about how you communicate across your organization and what will work for you. For us, we don't approve the change until we are approving the time. But what that means is it's on the requester to do some background work. So they need to figure out, they have to check with the registrar, make sure we're not messing with anybody. And they have to make sure there's not a football game that weekend and we're going to take down ticket sales. And it's <laughs> So we put, I mean, there's all kinds of things you have to think about. Mm -hmm. And we put that onus on the requester. I don't know that that's the best way to do it. We, it's something we continually talk about. Uh, we, in fact, this year, we are trying to put together just a basic checklist of all the groups on campus that need to be checked off before we are sure about a date. So it's a work in progress for us. And, and it is something you need to spend some time thinking about when you're putting together your approval process. And this this question actually came through and it's it's kind of in the same uh, part of the conversation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce it here. Is there a process um, or excuse me, if the change window needs to be extended during the change implementation, what would be the best practice? Um, so I would think part of scheduling is exactly what you just said is, is there a football game going on and we need to make sure we're not gonna impact that. Um, but that same idea of, okay, now we're in the throes of a change, the change is underway. It's gonna take longer than we thought it was. How do you handle it, that type of situation? So we, it's a, Again, some of it depends on the risk level of the change. I mean, if it's a low risk change in general, you go ahead and finish it and take what time you need. But especially high, medium and high risk changes, we need to make sure that we are doing what we said we do. And, and this does come up from time to time in changes. So um, the example I'll give is a couple of months ago, we had a high risk where we had to take down all connectivity on campus. And we told campus that we were going to take everything down at 7 a.m. And so it meant that students couldn't get to their online classes. They couldn't get to the internet and watch YouTube, which is a big deal for college students. It meant, <laughs> it meant all kinds of things. And we had communicated that we would start at 7 a.m. And 
as we had our go no go meeting the day before we were going to do this one of the database managers said now i'm going to start taking things down at 6 30 in the morning and i said oh no you're not <laughs> we told people 7 a.m we won't take things down till 7 a.m because there might be some student that's for some reason, submitting a paper at 6.49 a.m. And right. if they can't do that, it, it has an impact. And so then the next comment was, well then let's just not start until like 9 a.m. That'll be better for everybody anyway. And I said, no, because that's gonna push you to the end and you're gonna get into people's, you know. So I think it has to do with uh, your the impact that the change is having what you've communicated and how comfortable you are with going outside of what you promised. And I mean, my old sales background says you under promise and you over deliver. And I think that that's really important for changes that we, be, if, that we do what we say we're gonna do. And if we have to go outside of that, that there's good communication and there's a good understanding of what's happening and how much longer it'll be and those kind of things. I think IT people in general tend to, underestimate time. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's only going to take a minute. It's five minutes. Yeah, it's not a out. big deal. But you know, <laughs> for us, I mean, and if it's your, um, let's say you're a banker and your online banking's down and you need, you know, I mean, you know, five minutes can make all the difference in the world. So right. that's what we have to really consider is what's the impact. Right. Um, so I'm going to ask one more reporting question, and then we're going to move on to all things related to DevOps, because I have a, we have a bunch of questions in that context. <laughs> um, so this is actually an awesome question. Were you able to track system uptime slash availability improvements? Or when you did have failed changes, did you see uh, recovery time improvements? So the answer to that is no, because we were not measuring it before. I know, aren't you shocked? I'm shocked. It was a, <laughs> it was a tough time. So I would say that that is definitely something you should do. And it's, it's a great way to, to prove your worth. <laughs> we didn't because we didn't have the data, but of course we're better now. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm going to jump in and just say, anybody, if you've never looked at the state of DevOps report, please do, because they have a little set of metrics that ha have carried forward from the very introduction of that report um, to today. And it includes um, stuff like change lead time, the change failure rate, and also um, the time to recover when changes do in fact fail. And, and kind of one of the fundamental premises of making sure you're looking at that metric is that we all are being challenged to speed up. So we do have to learn to take intelligent risks now and then, right? But if we, if, mm -hmm. if we are, if we're moving more quickly and we're making changes more quickly, we sure as heck better be able to recover more quickly when, if things go wrong as well, right? Right, um, right. And so, and so looking at that, even though it's deemed an incident metric, it's influenced by how good a job you've done in terms of all your change related planning. So it, it's a really, really good metric to be looking at. Yeah, agreed. Um, so kind of along that lines, um, and we have a couple more minutes, um, and, and, I, and I just want to mention, hopefully everyone has been seeing that um, we have a really good um, little offering going on right now that if you sign up for any of our advanced Idle 4 education, um, we're offering a significant discount in your Idle 4 foundation education. So keep an eye out. You'll see the little advertisement for that come floating by uh, shortly. Just wanted to raise awareness. And if you need to drop off, we thank you very, very, very much for attending today. Um, but stick around. I'm going to continue to talk to Vicki about um, DevOps. So, Vicki, we got, you know, questions like, do you have any thoughts on, you know, change enablement in the context of DevOps? Um, we had a question about lead time, how you look at lead time um, in the context of uh, continuous delivery. Um, so any 
you know, anything you want to share? I know you're, as I recall, your DevOps journey is is kind of just starting there. Um, what can you share about how you're approaching that? Yeah, we are definitely just in the infant stages of DevOps, but we know that's where we need to go. So I, I'm i taking the courses and I'm doing the training and, and I'm trying to learn things about it as well. So um, there's definitely value there, but it, it's not a, it's not something we considered when we adopted two years ago. Right. So it's one of those things where you do clearly have to adapt your yeah. um, processes um, and practices. Um, what you know, I'll, I'll answer one of the questions that got asked. The there was a question that got asked about lead time, and you know, when Vicky talked about lead time, she talked about lead time in the context of when when you have to submit your change record, right? And so that all the risk assessment can be done, so the uh, communication can occur and so forth. When you think about DevOps and specifically continuous delivery, a thing to keep in mind always is that we're talking about very, very small changes. So a lot of the documentation is really going to be embedded in the code itself or in your, um, in your tool chain um, itself. So in a, in a lot of organizations that are really mature in the context of continuous delivery, that there is no submitting of the record ahead of time. At the moment you submit your code, that record gets created and a continuing log of how that change is performing as it makes its way through the continuous delivery pipeline is being collected and added to that change record. Um, so the change records being created kind of simultaneous to, um, you know, when the change is actually being, ma being made through the continuous delivery pipeline. So um, for a lot of organizations, that's being treated as a standard change. And what they're really looking at is how secure and how trusted is their pipeline, how comprehensive is their testing strategy, are the right things being tested to ensure that that change is not only performing the way it's supposed to, but also that if there are compliance related issues, those are being addressed as the change makes its way through its pipeline. So lead time shifts from being some mandatory timeframe within you, which you have to submit a change record before you can make the change to really being what lead time's all about from a lean standpoint, which is kind of the time from which you started your work to the time to which you finished your work. So you look at it very, very differently in, in the world of DevOps. Um, yeah, and I will tell you now, where we are now versus where we are when we started, the tool we use gathers our stories for development. And, and then based on how we do sprints, our, our, the, at the end of our sprint, our, the tool we use, can, uh, puts together all of those stories and we have an automated change record created and then that change record is a standard change and and so the the trust like you said is built into that development team and that testing that they do and and their processes awesome and we had a, several questions about do you use a tool what tool do you use does your tool integrate changes instance problems so Maybe spend a minute talking about your tool. <laughs> All right, cat out of the bag. We use ServiceNow, and but now we, I, I told you at the beginning, we have lots of legacy systems. So we still have a version of Remedy running. We still have a version of Footprints running. Um, we have at least five homegrown systems running, and that's part of actually a four-year project is transitioning all of those legacy systems into the ServiceNow environment. Boy, I bet folks are uh, fighting and kicking and scratching through that process. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a bit, there's lots of opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, exactly. It's lots of opportunity, and I do love coming to work every day. So it's, um, I, I love the challenge of it. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the higher ed environment is interesting. We, you have, I mean, I work with people that have worked in IT at Georgia Tech for 40 years. So that mixed with us being this leading 
research institution in the in the uh, you know globally right. and we have these students that are doing this amazing research and innovation and those kind of things married with legacy systems so it's a really cool place to work if you ever mm -hmm. have an opportunity yeah it's an interesting environment for sure um one last question i think this is the last question um It has to do with closing changes. Does the system auto close? Does the change requester close? How, you know, is there a required time frame for closing changes? What does that process look like? The um, the way it works for us is the the implementer closes out their tasks, and and in closing out the tasks, they submit the change for review, and then a change manager goes in and reviews it makes any comments and formally closes it. Excellent. And I realize I did just miss one question. And I I think it kind of spoke to this with your tool consolidation, but um, did any of your folks use other tools to store their artifacts and their documentation? Um, and so do they not want to enter change requests because they feel like they're doing work, uh, double work? <laughs> Absolutely, yes, 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 uh, all over the place. In fact, um, I, I just complete transparency. We have our far, our, ooh, there was some southern came out just then. Our <laughs> firewall rule um, process. So anyone that has a firewall change request, they it initially did not go through change. Uh, they had their own system, they had their own database, they lived and died by it. And we have over the last year transitioned that into change management. And there are several systems like that across campus. Some of that has to do with us having distributed IT. So change management mm -hmm. reports up through the CIO, but we have IT units, like 300 other IT employees on campus that don't report through the CIO. So that's part of our challenge. And I mean, there's still things for us to continue to consolidate. So lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always, always. Um, all right, uh, we're we're kind of at time, and I think we've gotten all of the questions. I do want to say, Vicky, we got tons of people who said we would love. Anytime you offered a document, <laughs> somebody piped in and said yes, please. So um, I'll you know I'll, I'll I'll chat with you offline, and we'll get kind of some of the the key documents that you talked about and we'll pass them along to the folks who attended uh, the webinar today. Um, and uh, thank you for offering those up. And thank you in general. Um, I'm seeing great job. Dot, yeah, people again are piping in. Yes, please uh, pass along <laughs> the documents, but awesome job. Um, and I want to say you just, you just got an awesome job from Greg Sanker, who was oh, in fact out there. I was going to tease Greg Sanker when Vicky, hero. when Vicky was, you know, bragging on you. I was like, oh, please don't brag on him. He's going to just make his head big. He's going to be, you know. <laughs> but uh, we, we, uh, we, we too, Vicky, are fans of Greg Sanker. So, uh, um, and everybody, uh, awesome job. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we thank everybody out there for joining us today. And please join us uh, next month as well.